Okay, good afternoon. This is uh, the beginning of session three. And we return to the theme of energy, energy efficiency, and our energy futures. The first speaker in this session is Professor Robert Sokolow. Rob is a, um, let's say, uh, Ivy League pedigreed and careered person who's really a left coaster in disguise. <laughs> he uh, earned his PhD in what else? Physics at Harvard, 1964. He taught at Yale, and uh, he has been since 1971 uh, on the faculty of Princeton University, where he's currently professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Rob um, has known Art for a long time, and I'm hoping he will tell us exactly how long, but I'm sure it predates Art's second career, goes back to his first. The, um, and for 20 years, from 1979 to 1998, Rob was the director of Princeton Center for Energy and Environmental Studies, which uh, I think those of us at Berkeley saw as uh, our biggest competitor in uh, ergy type of things. So um, one, one just other note is that a couple of years ago, uh, Rob and a colleague from Stanford published an article in Science called Stabilization Wedges solving the uh, climate problem for the next 50 years with current technologies. I find this to be a really wonderful piece in helping us move the debate as I think it is essential for us to move from the question, is climate change happening, to what ought we do about it. And I think it's a nice counterpoint to some uh, propositions that suggest that we're going to just produce a lot of carbon-free energy as the way to uh, solving our problem. So let's welcome Rob Sokolow. No, it's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. There's, there's some, it's at W.C. Fields who said there was no club that he could be invited to that he wanted to be a member of. Well, this is a club I've been invited to that I truly want to be a member of. Groucho Marx, Inter <laughs> interchangeable. Uh, second of all, my colleague in this wedges work, Pakala, actually works for Princeton. He's another left coaster. Um, he's an ecologist, and we run the carbon project together. That's an erratum. Um, and uh, no, I, it, okay. So I, I need to. We have so few minutes that I need to remind you, uh, or to tell you, that I first met Mark. Uh, art in one of the quiet times in Berkeley. Nineteen sixty four to sixty six were my postdoctoral years here at, at Berkeley in the physics department and art was a, very much in the particle physics world. In spite of that a reminder of something called the free speech movement and Mario Savio across the street from here in the Greek theater being dragged off by some police by his tie and a few other things that were quite remarkable of that period, we managed to get some physics done. And uh, the paper I'm most proud of from that time, Art was really a, a handmaiden of. Uh, it was experimentalists developing some new information about masses of mesons, and Shelley Glashow and I trying to understand it, and then thanks to Art's social engineering, three back-to-back -back papers and physical review letters. I'm the only one on the program, I think, who actually knew Art, in and moderately well in, the, in that first career of his. And I want to make sure people here know just quite how prominent he was. I actually knew Art five years before I met him by something in my wallet, namely the Rosenfeld tables. The Rosenfeld tables were, Art was always thinking about how to package things, right? So masses, masses and, and decay rates and branching ratios and error bars of the fundamental particles, as they were called, the so-called subnuclear zoo, they were organized for all of us in the field by this card, which folded in three and fit in your wallet, and which got changed more often than your auto registration, <laughs> because information kept improving. And Art was given the job by the worldwide physics community, I'm not exaggerating, to be the, the gatekeeper of whether a new piece of science was good and so good that it should displace a previous number, or good enough to be averaged in with the previous numbers, or sufficiently flawed to be dismissed in terms of these wallet cards. So you can see in the, st one of the things that's fascinating when people leave physics for something else is there is a continuity in the style in which they've done the old field and the new one. 
And I think in that little bit of a story, you can, you can see that. I was actually present at Art's conversion. <laughs> that happened in, well, we heard that Art was, was stunned and to new thinking by the Arab embargo of the fall of 93, as were all of us who were around and sentient at the time, 73. Uh, but the following summer at Princeton, we had a summer study. And, and uh, at least, uh, at, at, at least three, two other members, aside from Art and me, of that study are, are here. Uh, Sam Berman, whose name, I guess, is not on that particular page. It's the Windows part. It's the, second, it's the next page, which didn't fit. And, um, and, and, and help me, uh, David Claridge, whose name I think may also, can't even find it, is, is also on another page, page two. Page two. Um, it, was a, uh, it was a triumph in a sense. It was physicists self-organizing to address what they considered a new problem. And the, the, about 10 years later, I was asked to write in physics today about the summer study of the past, now, thir now quite a bit further back, 30 years back, and I thought I'd take a little quote from there rather than trying to sum it up. <laughs> Although the book about Quiche hadn't been written yet, a strong message in the early 1970s was that real men don't study how to use less energy. <laughs> we physicists, I'm sorry, I dropped an S. We physicists who worked together on the 1974 American Physical Society summer study were seeking to undermine the belief that it is appropriate for physicists to work on problems of energy supply but inappropriate for us to work on problems of energy use. Our counterexamples would be ourselves. Okay, so uh, mention has already been made of uh, a nice paper that's, that Steve Pakala and I wrote just two years ago that organizes for people a quantitative view of the carbon problem by making it simple in a way that clearly is in, in my, in unmistakably a debt to our physics education. That sets out a uh, two alternative paths for carbon, one of which, the upper one, summarizes what people think might happen in the absence of carbon policy, namely a doubling of today's situation where we are pulling 7 billion tons of carbon out of the ground every year, almost all of which is becoming carbon dioxide within a few months. And on the other hand, a flat path, which in some sense represents what would be nice to be able to accomplish in response to the carbon challenge. There are uh, people who criticize both of those lines from various directions. One that is going to be much harder than, than would be much more than 14 billion tons of carbon if we do nothing. Another is that 7 billion tons of carbon 50, uh, 50 years from now isn't low enough. I think in John Holdren's comments this morning, you would, ex you would decide that you had to do better than that. I will nonetheless endow a party for people in their 20s who are here in the room, I hope there are some, to gather and have, and, 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 and have some champagne, assuming there's still champagne, um, if, uh, if we get as low as seven. But everything I'm saying today, of course you can do still more. And of course, and that orange line is meant to remind you, you don't get to stabilization at 500 parts per million unless you are going to, 50 years from now, uh, cut substantially another factor of two uh, uh, from those emissions over the following 50 years. So we introduced this concept called the wedge. There were seven wedges in that previous picture. There is, each one of them is a billion tons of carbon not emitted into the atmosphere 50 years from now because of some deliberate policy, some deliberate strategy, some deliberate campaign. And then the game is to talk about various campaigns and see how big a wedge is. And so a wedge, for example, is building two, one million two megawatt windmills that, are, that displace coal-fired power plants. One million two, th two megawatt windmills. And I'll give you some more examples as we move along and the paper we wrote is full of them. Um, if it's a straight line, and one of the things we were doing with this curve, and some of you in the room may be able to take this message away, draw straight lines, not exponentials. The number of people who are baffled by exponentials is large. The number of people who, <laughs> the number of people who can calculate the area of a triangle is actually also pretty large. So 25 billion tons of carbon, and a price I'd like you to have in your minds as we go through this talk, $100 a ton of carbon means a $2.5 trillion campaign, large enough to make large industries interested. Um, okay, so efficient use of electricity is one of the places where you look for wedges. 
you have all kinds of arbitrariness about what that baseline of 14 billion tons of carbon might be, but credibly, there could be, well, 40% of carbon emissions today are coming from the electric sector and 60% from direct burning. So if you have 6 billion tons of carbon a year in the base case coming from uh, electricity, then the question is what fraction comes from buildings. I'm going to show you that plausibly it could be 70%, in which case there'd be 4 billion tons of carbon just associated with the electricity use in buildings. And then we could whack away at that with our wedges. And we might ha not have any better target than that. And we may be, get 25% out or 50. So I became interested in, in, a, in a variable called the fraction of electricity that is being go going to power plants. And I'm going to tell you in the next three slides actually some new stuff. I wanted to bring something new to art, and this is my little present. Um, approximately 70% of U.S. electricity is today is used in buildings and only 30 percent in industry. I didn't know that. And the only... I knew that. You did. <laughs> I'm not done. I'm not done. I haven't had a student like that in a class for a while. <laughs> um, the three quantities that have arrows, the electricity in buildings, in residential commercial buildings, and the transport energy are the three quantities going up, whereas the fuel in buildings and the industrial sector are not going up in the U.S. Um, the spaghetti diagram of the U.S. for 2002 indicates that 70 percent, and it I found, looking for old papers to prepare this talk, a 1976 spaghetti diagram and it was indicating that seven, only 60% of electricity went to buildings. So it's a number that's going up. And it is as good a statement to say that a power plant is a building as it is to say an oil field is a vehicle. And we aren't doing that, though. We have a buildings and vehicles problem. And the post-industrial society in particular is a buildings and vehicle problem. So, Art, do you know what the curve looks like for the 12 IEA regions of this particular variable? <laughs> It is this. This was prepared with the help of David Goldstein and, and, uh, and Paul Wade at IEA, whom I have not met, but worked very hard to produce these data, and a colleague of mine, uh, Shoibal Chakravati. Except for the green point, I do have a, do I have a pointer here? Do I have a pointer? Oh, here, right. No. This, this no, Well, that would work with okay. the third button, bottom button. Okay, except for this point which is a 1976 point. The other points are all about 2002. And it indicates that in the developing world, which is all the circles, the non-OECD countries are circles, and the OECD countries are diamonds. In the non-OECD world, about 40% to 50% of the electricity is in the building sector. In, the, in Europe, it's in the 60s, in low 60s, as it was for the US in the, in the 70s, 1970s. And it's over 70% in the U.S. So what there is a vector both in time and in wealth, which suggests that we are moving more and more to a world where it's electricity in buildings, which is the problem, stupid. <laughs> and let's get on with it. And yet we heard for, two, for four, three hours this morning how great California is doing on this. So there is several messages. One is the problem is immense. And, and two is California's got a lot to teach us. But it's about what's going on in buildings which is not where we started, many of us, which was the building shell and the appliances. And, it's, and it's some of those are the appliances and some of those are the other things doing in buildings. And it suggests that we have to reinvent the building, something I'm going to be saying again. So, Art, this is a new graph. Um, the, where does that power coming from? Now, I wanna, this, is a, this paper, this figure, which uh, appeared in a Scientific American article I wrote last summer, was suggested by David Hawkins in which we're comparing two different things. On the left is all of the carbon that's been pulled out of the ground in fossil fuels to now. And the right is all of the carbon that is committed if the power plants are built that, are, that IEA says will be built between now and 2030. And there is as much coal in those commitments as there is in all the coal that's been dug out of the ground. There's an assumption I'm making of a 60-year half-life, 60-year life, well, it could be half-life, 60-year life of a coal plant. And the gas is actually more. Now, not all that power will probably be built uh, even, in an, 
even IEA questions that, but it would be built in a world that didn't pay attention to carbon or efficiency. And it shows how urgent the task is, because those plants are being built, as we saw the rate for China, at an incredible clip at this very period. We have almost no time to, to spare. And, the, and when people talk about what are the most urgent problems, they're the ones which involve the investments that are commitments of a very long period of time. And for those of you with policy backgrounds, I'm going to try to address a lot of this talk to the people who are in the back who aren't saying anything, but I hope are thinking about what to do with their lives in this general direction. We have no account, a commitment accounting, by which I mean that in addition to any given year when we would announce how much carbon we consumed, we would also talk about how, how much carbon was embedded in the investments we had made that year. We could start with California. Let it just say it produced such, such a number of, of factories and power plants um, and how much carbon was associated and, and, and bought ca cars were sold in the, in the state and so on. And we need to do it nationally, internationally. That will, pay that will make us pay attention to the longer term future. So commitment accounting. What's going on in a positive sense in your own backyard, but how many of you know about a Long Beach uh, uh, gasification project that was announced in early February? A fair, no, quite a lot. Oh, I'm pleased. So there we have the first uh, solid fuel to power with carbon capture and storage, a uh, new project uh, in, in history. It's going on right in your state. It can be enriched by science with, the, with careful negotiations with the various industrial actors involved. Schwarzenegger was there at the, at the announcement. Um, it's right downtown. The gasifier would be built uh, right on the site of the refinery. It will produce 510 megawatts of, of grid electricity, and it's using as a feedstock not coal, but a chemical uh, almost, the, almost the same, which is petroleum coke, the bottom of the barrel of oil. Every, every refinery has such a resource. A lot of it has been exported because it's too dirty to burn in this country. It's a nasty, dirty secret of the oil industry, which will come to an end. And in the process, through processes like this, with an essentially a negative cost fuel, you'll begin to open up this future of carbon dioxide capture and storage associated with the burning of fossil fuel well, where we have to build it, where we have to burn it. Um, the high, what goes on here is the carbon dioxide and hydrogen is the product of the gasification. There is a shift reactor that turns that into carbon dioxide and hydrogen. They are then chemically separated. Carbon dioxide goes below ground and the hydrogen runs turbines, which are a new class of turbines that GE and Siemens are eager to try out. And so you have a, a world of where the big industries are paying attention. And with this project moved to the United States with no encouragement, needless to say, from our, from our uh, central administration. But it was made sense economically in this country at this time. There were elements of the uh, both state and national policy that were favorable, clearly. But here it is, and it's in your state, and let's, let's get the most out of it. One, uh, one thought about economics of projects like this. People have asked me, how expensive is this? And I, I, this is a, a way of answering the question. If, if you're a utility producing coal at a coal power plant today, at the bus bar, at the time where you're exporting it onto the high voltage lines, it's something like four cents a kilowatt hour. Of that, about one cent is the coal, and about three cents is the paying for the power plant. By the time you're buying it, it's about 10 cents. All these numbers are rounded off in different parts of the country. Because, oh, you can't say it. So one plus three plus six. And onto that, you get two cents for the carbon capture and storage job. So how expensive it is depends on what you're comparing it to. And for a coal company, it's tripling the cost of their coal arriving at the power plant, and they're competing with natural gas. They're going to fight. Um, at, the, at the bus bar, well, what's the electric, what's the electric uh, guy competing with? It's not quite the same. At the customer side, it's 20%. So it's a very different story, depending on these three different views. But that's about how much it costs. Um, okay, now I want, I want to just say a word about fuels, because it is the other part of the problem. And efficient use of fuels is, of course, the product of the of the gallons per mile of the vehicle and the distances we're traveling. So in two images, one is of mass transit. I made a point of coming from the airport to here by BART yesterday. That's, that's a strenuous thing, but I did it. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there were, there were trips not taken like telecommuting. So a, a car going 30 miles a gallon and 10,000 miles in a year is gonna put a ton of carbon, not a ton of carbon in the, in the in the metaphoric way, but a real ton of carbon <laughs> in the atmosphere in a year. Um, and so 
2 billion cars, which we may well have in 2050, will put 2 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere at 30 miles a gallon and one at 60 miles a gallon. So getting the cars to be 60 mile a miles a gallon instead of 30 miles a gallon is a wedge in our language of wedges. Also, if they're at 30 miles a gallon, going 5,000 miles instead of 10,000 miles, because we've re rearranged our cities, is a wedge. And going 5,000 miles a year at 60 miles a gallon is one and a half wedges. We all knew that. Um, that's imitating Art's tone, right? Um, <laughs> the, the, the wedges are popular enough that the US administration, in what's called the Climate Change Technology Plan, CCTP, which as far as I know is still in draft, but it was in draft in September, had a page with a you know, colored background box about the wedges and reproduced a number of our calculations, not all of them, and added a couple. One was on landfills and had five significant figures, so I knew it wasn't mine. <laughs> um, and it had one change. It only changed one number of the ones it took from our paper. And that was that it said that, that a wedge would be a billion cars driven 10,000 miles a year at 40 miles a gallon instead of 20, which is a correct calculation, rounding off in various ways. They was, there was somebody who went to work at the DOE, uh, presumably more than one day, who was dealing with getting this into that report, who thought it would be a good thing to do not to have the US government associated with a, in a document with the concept of a 60 mile a gallon car. I mean, I think this is extraordinary. It was, it was a rewriting just to make sure that it wasn't out of, you know, sort of, there was, this was somebody who believed that it would be, a, it would be, there would be trouble if it were actually in a government document for a vehicle in 2055 for the world. So it's quite extraordinary what we have in the way of an uphill struggle. But I, I thought that detail was worth sharing with you. Those, that fuel, what are, the, what are the targets on the fuel side? I believe the target number one on the fuel side for carbon management is something we haven't heard a lot about, but which it seems to me is going to be coming in sooner, sooner not later, which is synthetic fuels from coal, um, gas and oil. And um, to get a sense of what's involved, we now use 80 million barrels a day of oil. The flow of 24 million barrels a day is, one, is the flow of a billion tons of carbon. It's a number that nobody has gotten used to. And uh, you'd have to, so leaving some inefficiencies in there, you'd have to have about a third of our current oil use coming from sin fuels to be, uh, in, which, uh, in which case you'd be actually putting two billion tons of carbon in the air. Because the driving a mile on sin fuel from coal is going to put about twice as much CO2 in the atmosphere as if it's from petroleum for the same vehicle, of course. So you can capture that other carbon. And so it seems to me that the, Engineers and policymakers need to make a compact with this new technology, which we har hardly know, that we will only make synthetic fuels from coal if we capture CO2 at the places where we do it, in which case it will be no worse than petroleum. Um, and I think that could happen. The, the, um, and, and the, how tempting this is, a 10% increase in our coal production devoted to this gets a million barrels a day of syn fuels. And the, uh, of syn fuels displacing oil, and one million barrels a day is the currency of the oil game. And getting a million barrels a day in 10 years to ease the market is going to be very interesting. The whole biofuels program is going to be getting a million barrels a day if it's multiplied by five from where it is right now. Domestically, I'm talking. And of course, all this could happen globally. So for the policy, for the policy folk here, I want to sign this problem for your next five years. A key goal of climate change policy should be to enable the arrival of the earliest possible date of a time after which all new coal plants for both power and fuels are built with CCS. California pull is incredibly important. The fact that you are importing from Colorado and Wyoming, Montana, your power, and that means that you have the buyer's leverage, and using that buyer's leverage is probably more important for the next 10 years than anything you're doing at home. I truly mean that, affecting the way in which the coal development goes in the Rocky Mountain states. Make sure you're averaging it into your numbers. Make sure you're paying attention to the numbers and don't buy what you don't want. I'm, I'm gonna have to skip uh, several slides because I wanna suggest, because I got a number three a minute ago. A couple of minutes more? How many? Can I, let, me, let me start here. There's an argument that we use up things. We have to, you can, after all, only make a car infinite miles a gallon. You can only go so far. But 
in many of these instances, like how many windmills you can build and so on, the question is, do you use these things up? Are the first, two million, two, uh, are the first million two megawatt wind turbines more expensive or cheaper than the second? There, is, there are two competing factors. The first million will be built at more favorable sites, but the second million will benefit from the learning. Which, which dominates? Wherever arts influence is felt, the Rosenfeld effect, learning will dominate. I'm going to propose that the, we think the philosophers here realize that we're talking here, fumbling around in all of these talks about a systema, un, unable to think systematically about the future, about five years versus 10. So I'm proposing a word for your vocabulary, prospicience. We need a new word for the art and science of looking ahead. In the past 50 years, we've been aware great of so many aspects of our past, the solar system, the Big Bang, the solar system, the uh, evolution on, on the planet, the DNA, can we achieve a comparable quantitative understanding of human civilization at various future times? So when we're talking about 50 years ahead, we know what belongs there. In 500, we know what belongs there. Our, our working with nuclear waste is completely nuts because of the way in which we've confused these numbers. Imagine spending as much effort on our collective destiny on Earth as we spend on our personal destiny in the afterlife. <laughs> What if we had, what if we had a world transformed by deliberate attention to carbon? We were sitting in 2055 and we were looking back at what would have had to have happened. Institutions for carbon management that reliably communicate the price of carbon would have happened. We couldn't get there without that. If wedges of nuclear power achieved strong international enforcement mechanisms to control nuclear proliferation, we won't have nuclear power for long if we don't have those institutions. If wedges of carbon capture and storage are achieved, we will have had to have widespread uh, permitting of geological storage. And if wedges of renewable energy and enhanced storage in forests and so soils are achieved, extensive land reclamation and rural development. And most important of all, we will have had to have had a planetary consciousness come into being. And all in all, I find this not an unhappy prospect. Finally, Art, I'm going to read you a poem, one of my favorites, favorites of some other people I know. It's Robert Frost's Two Tramps in Mud Time. And I'm not reading all of it, but three verses. Out of the mud, two strangers came and caught me splitting wood in the yard, and one of them put me off my aim by hailing cheer cheerily, hit them hard. I knew pretty well while he, why he dropped behind and let the other go on away. I knew pretty well what he had in mind. He wanted to take my job for pay. Nothing on either side was said. They knew they had but to stay there, stay, and all their logic would fill my head as that I had no right to play with what was another man's work for gain. My right might be love, but theirs was need. And where the two exist in twain, theirs was the better right. Agreed. But yield who will to their separation, my object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. Only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sakes. The door is open for questions. It's almost reduced, reduced art to tears. It did. I did, and I'm, I'm so pleased. <laughs> Uh, I'm Art Rosenfeld. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm upstaging my PV and Diane Grunig, but Rob, um, are, are you actually aware that uh, the PUC and the CEC did pass a resolution, I guess, that all future imported coal in California shall be as clean as a modern uh, gas-fired power plant? Uh, I think I am sort of aware of that because we, we are talking to the people in Wyoming, not California, and they are, uh, they are feeling this. <laughs> and this is really great. This is really great. I mean, that's why I said it so strongly. I mean, it's going to be a matter of looking after all of these things and maybe starting to say that it has to have capture and storage in it as well. The natural gas number isn't, isn't good enough uh, because it's going to be around for 50 years. 
But at least we think that's a pretty good. I don't think it's good enough. Stop. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina Karsberg, uh, representing myself. <laughs> and my question is a really geeky question that I feel kind of embarrassed to ask since you just had this nice poem. But um, have you thought about the, how do you say that, prospeciance? Prospeciance. Uh, prospeciance having to do with uh, some of the chemical effects of the uh, greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide, like the ocean acidification. I mean, I know we're all thinking about energy and stuff, but well, some uh, folks say that that could be a really bad problem too. And okay, well where did I get to prospicience from? I mean, I could have gotten it from watching us enshrine half-lives of nucleides, like plutonium-239, as governing principles for uh, managing nuclear waste, which is, if you think about it, pretty crazy. Um, the, the problem that I'm confronting, we do not yet have any rules anywhere in the world about what will be sufficient storage of carbon dioxide below ground. This job is, of the is a job for the next five to ten years. The Europeans have a trading system for CO2. They are immediately confronting which storage programs to allow to be counted is as carbon credits, which means how good does the storage have to be? Once you set rules, and you can buy insurance if you guessed wrong and things like that, but you need the rules, which means a social consensus, which requires thinking systematically about the future. And whether, if it comes up in 100 years, we'll be so much smarter that we will be able to undo whatever happens, because we're all, that's a con, economics with discounting rates, that don't worry if it comes up in 100 years, the damage will be negligible, because we'll be so smart. On the other hand, there's something in an environmental person who wants to make it a very long time, and in the geologists who want to make it a very long time, because they're, pr they're so proud that they can do it. They're convinced they need a strong t title, and they'll give us a problem, we'll solve it, which is what happened to nuclear waste, right? So there is a need for systematic thinking about hundreds versus thousands versus 10,000 years, and we're not preparing ourselves for it. I see a department of prospicience in Berkeley in 10 years. I mean, I think it's just a whole new set of issues. It might be a, it might be a subfield of philosophy, but I doubt it. Where did the microphone go? Dan. Dan Kamen. Rob, I want to congratulate you on the prospicience, because I do think that's the key issue, and we probably have four or maybe five, depending how we count, generations of sustainability scientists in this room. And so, you know, working from arts influence and this, you know, this influence diagram perspective, this is a much more attractive place to go than the people who are so obsessed with saying, we need a disaster of the right size. You know, we need to tune our disasters to get action, which is my least favorite statement as to how we would get people to do things. And I would love to hear a discussion that, that might follow right now about what are the things we've learned about making that science policy interface? The ecologists have the, Le the Aldo Leopold Forum, which is one place where scientists can get some of the training, politicians can get some of the reverse, but it's pretty clear that one of the things we haven't done to support your new department is to figure out how to get all voters and scientists to be able to direct not equal amounts by each scientist. Some people want to do more, some people want to do less. Enough of their work focused on making this sort of change happen. And I would love to hear from you know, from people like Devra and the generations around the room, what are the things that they have gotten in terms of mentorship and in terms of learning about how to do that sort of work that will make that happen? Because it's pretty clear that all of us scientists have so far failed to do that, except for in the case where a few well-positioned or well-thoughtful politicians have taken up the messages. We haven't gotten this as a pipeline to do the sort of thing you're describing, yeah. but I, you know, we better be on the fringe of it now, and I just congratulate you for doing that. Yeah, so I'd I love think to hear this, you yeah, and others comment on I, it. I'll say a couple. I don't think the scientists have really identified this problem, and the nuclear group is, I think, the worst. There is really a view in the nuclear community that if you could tra trade a 24,000-year or a 50,000-year half-life isotope for a 50-year half-life isotope, you've, made an, you've, you've accomplished something positive, whereas nowhere else would I think that would, anybody would believe that. Yes. That's the whole nuclear waste destruction program, is to, to get rid of 10,000-year half-life stuff in favor of shorter-lived stuff. That just, you know, it, it, to me it means we're not thinking strategically about this problem, because there would be a, that's a real headache, 30-year half-life stuff, as we know from Chernobyl, whose 20th anniversary we're celebrating this week. We have time for one more question. Up, uh, wherever the mic is, that's going to be the last Seems one. to be in my hand. Uh, Diane Grunick, uh, California Public Utility Commissioner. I just wanted to... Um, 
Two things. One, on what the point that you were just making, it actually comes back to thinking about one of the lessons I learned from art probably third, 30 years ago about in energy efficiency, thinking about life cycle costing. And it's the same idea of looking at the entire life of the measure and being able to measure the savings as opposed to just the um, first year increased cost. But I also wanted to follow up on the remark that Art had made about um, what we are trying to do here uh, as far as the poll in California. And with um, President Peavy, my fellow commissioner, we're actually having the first ever joint workshop on the West Coast on May 24th of our commission and Oregon and Washington that is jointly going to be talking about climate change as well as um, IGCC and carbon sequestration. We've invited all of the West Coast commissioners and it's a real effort to try to get out there as strongly as we can the discussion on carbon sequestration and make it a reality. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just end with, whenever you set up your department, um, let the rest of us know. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. It's going to happen right here first. It always happens here first. Um, let me finish with this. There's one slide I skipped that I really would like. Just wh what can the research community do? I, there are young researchers here. And carbon is capture and storage. We are nowhere near the, the, the cutting the costs out of that system. We're separating CO2 at atmospheric pressure, when then repressurizing it to put it below ground. So there are whole opportunities for, for separation. In storage, we haven't really figured out, and uh, the people presumably in this audience know a lot about this, how do you inject CO2 into a porous formation so the maximum amount of it stays over the longer term? How does it displace the fluid it's going into? That's not a problem that's been, is quite like any problem in the, in the below ground world before. I think we have to, in both the buildings, I think we're nowhere near optimizing what a building is. We've got all these separate motors, we've got all these separate electronics, we've got coupling to the ground, we've got the, the roof, and we still are really, we, we're, we're giving ourselves the easy, we, it's, cri it's critical what's happened in, in California. But I think there can be another generation of invention that's much more radical. And people are talking about that, both to integrate the, the thermal building and, and the electrical building. Um, and you know, hydrogen safety is another one of the issues that is just hanging there. We really haven't come to grips with whether we can manage hydrogen if we ever want, would we ever want it if we could get there. And uh, in renewables, the scale up issue. The fact that we are, so many things look attractive when they're in small quantities, which are going to be completely different if they're tens and hundreds of millions of hectares. What are the issues that can be raised by that? There are some examples, but I'm not going to take any more time now. Thank you, Ron. So um, our next speaker is Director Stephen Chu. Dr. Stephen Chu, uh, the director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Dr. Chu earned his PhD here in what else? Physics. Uh, his mentor was Gene Cummins. Uh, it happens a small side story, I just can't resist. Uh, I earned my bachelor's degree here in physics about the same time that Stephen was uh, doing his PhD and postdoctoral work, and one of my absolutely favorite professors is Gene Cummins. Uh, after completing his PhD, uh, Steve went to Bell Labs where he was uh, a scientist for about a decade and uh, then was attracted to Stanford um, where he became professor of physics in 1987. Uh, served there until very recently when he was attracted back across the bay to take on the directorship of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, he was awarded as um, many of you know, maybe even most of you know, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997 for his uh, achievements in the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light. Uh, and one of the aspects of being a Nobel laureate, I think it's this is common, is that one posts an autobiography, and I'd like to read you a little excerpt from his uh, autobiography. Uh, virtually all of our aunts and uncles had PhDs in science or engineering, and it was taken for granted that the next generation of Chews were to follow this, the family tradition. When the dust had settled, my two brothers and four cousins collected three MDs, four PhDs, and a law degree. I could manage only a single advanced degree. In this family of accomplished scholars, I was to become the academic black sheep. I <laughs> I performed adequately at school, but in comparison to my older brother who set the record for the highest cumulative average for our high school, 
My performance was decidedly mediocre. Oh, that we could all be so mediocre. <laughs> Dr. Chu, please. Um, thank you. Um, I think getting a Nobel Prize only leveled the playing field in my mother's eyes. Uh, <laughs> um, in, in fact, to this day, I, I, I'm going to use up my precious minutes. I, I was talking to her about a month ago, and and she was saying that uh, when she was a classmate of Cian Yang, who got a Nobel Prize in physics at the age of 35, one of uh, truly eminent uh, theoretical physicist, and she says, oh yes, when he was an undergraduate, we all knew he was going to get a Nobel Prize. And I teased her and, and said, well, I guess you never thought I was going to get a Nobel Prize. She just ignored it. And, and then um, and I said, but maybe you thought Gilbert, the older brother, would get a Nobel Prize. And he says, oh yeah, the only reason he didn't get it is he wasn't as good in politics. <laughs> <laughs> The, the sad truth is the younger brother is the smartest of the three of us. Uh, anyway, um, top in a list of national concerns and really international concerns are national security. And national security is intimately tied to energy security. Uh, it also, if the energy, if we don't have access to energy or if the cost of energy goes up by an order of magnitude, that would have severe uh, constraints on economic prosperity. And finally, uh, the environment, uh, from local pollution to climate change. And so the need for sustainable CO2 neutral energy is really among the most important problems uh, that we face today, and that has to be solved by science and technology. Um, there has to be a dual strategy. Uh, you've been hearing uh, this morning and, and early afternoon that conservation, that is to say maximize energy efficiency, minimize its use, while uh, not killing the economy is really um, something that uh, is top in the list. And this is and still remains the lowest hanging fruit uh, in what to do in the coming decades. But that doesn't mean that conservation and energy efficiency will solve it all. You have to have new sources of clean energy. Uh, this is a, a graph of uh, the energy demand uh, per capita. So on the x-axis is GDP per person. And on the y-axis is the primary energy use per person. And here we are, the, the leader, uh, <laughs> in both wealth and in energy use. And sur surely we would like to be down here with France, UK, Japan, and others. But actually, they want to be down here. And I think it's very possible, without dramatically altering, altering lifestyle, to be down here somewhere. And a lot of the things that art has pioneered in his uh, three or four decades uh, it will be bringing us perhaps down here, but, but the target is really down here. And here is China and India um, holding uh, promise, uh, will they grow uh, to US stature or will they be over here? Um, as you increase energy, you can be on several slopes so this is uh, primary energy use and the amount of CO2 you're emitting. This is the line for coal. And so per unit of energy that you uh, generate by burning coal, it's about a factor two, a little bit more than a factor two of natural gas. And so we're all kind of slurping along this line near oil, but oil is going to be running out. And in fact, we don't use oil for, for generating electricity. Uh, we use primarily coal, natural gas. And there's an outlier over here. This is France, which uses 85% of its electrical generation is nuclear. And so we've got to figure out a way of getting, again, off of these slopes as well. So the demand side of the energy solution you've heard about today, uh, and you've seen this slide at least twice, uh, called the Rosenfeld effect. Um, this is the oil embargo and things of that nature. I, as far as I know, this is not really the Rosenfeld effect. This is one of the Rosenfeld effects. The Rosenfeld effect that I heard about was that in Building 90, where he had his office, uh, they were getting more and more efficient about consuming energy. It was going down and down and down. And then all of a sudden, there was a several months, there was a huge spike up. Couldn't understand why. They searched. Is there a heat leak? There's something terrible going on. Couldn't figure it out. Rosenfeld was on sabbatical. 
he works very, very hard, and late at night, 8, 10, 11 o'clock at night, he'd go around and turn off all the lights manually. When he was on sabbatical, no one was there to turn off the lights. So I think that's the original Rosenfeld effect. He concurs. Okay. So here we have our current energy sources, oil, coal, gas. You see, most it's, it's dominated by um, fossil fuel. And uh, so what is going to be happening in the future? So let's I'm going to walk, walk you through this very quickly. First on the top line is fossil fuels. Um, as I said, it looks like oil might last roughly 100 years, maybe gas another 100, 150 years. But then you have lots of coal, tar sands, shale oil, and even other forms of fossil fuel. And so here we are consuming more energy. This is the uh, mature economies. This is uh, China, India, and other emerging economies. And this is the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. And the question is, will we run off fossil fuel energy? And when will we run out? And so there's both good news and bad news. The good news is that we have at least two or 300 years, possibly 1,000 years of fossil fuel energy. The bad news is we have at least 200 or 300 years of possibly 1,000 years <laughs> of fossil fuel energy. Uh, if we use all that fossil fuel energy, um, we could easily make the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere go up not by two or four, but by more than an order of magnitude from pre-industrial revolution days in the next couple hundred years. And this is uh, the Kyoto Protocol, factor of two increase in CO2 from pre-industrial revolution. It is called climate change because actually down here in this particular computer model, it's uh, actually cooling down. But you notice something. It's very uneven. So the temperature rise is mostly over land, primarily because uh, in these models, it, it takes a while to transfer the heat to the ocean. But if you look at, at this stuff over here, even at two times CO2, the target of Kyoto Protocol, which is 550 parts per million CO2, we're talking about a two, three, three four uh, centigrade increase over, let's say, the agricultural, the great agricultural belt of the United States. By four times, we're seeing a huge increase. This is Fahrenheit. These are centigrade. So you're seeing an increase that's equal and more than the temperature difference from our time now, which is a warm period of time, to the coldest of the ice ages, where half the United States was under ice. So now think of that going the reverse way. So it would be pretty warm if you get, ever get to four times, at least according to this model. Um, there are new sets of models coming online as, as uh, techniques get better, as understanding gets better, and as um, computers get faster. And this is taken from the work of Anise Fung, who's a professor at UC Berkeley and also a, a, a member of our staff as well. And these new computer models are not now putting in just how much carbon dioxide is there, what happens to the Earth, but they're saying, let's suppose we stuff some carbon into the atmosphere. There are going to be feedbacks that, that are both uh, biologically based or geo and chemical based feedbacks. For example, as the temperature warms up and there's more CO2, there's going to be more photosynthesis occurring, more plant life springs into effect. And this is very helpful because that is now going to sequester the CO2. And so the latest round of models are beginning to put in these feedbacks. What are they predicting? Well, this is again from these Fung's data. Uh, this is a very aggressive increase in the amount of CO2 uh, and sure enough, the land and ocean are sequestering carbon, and, uh, but the, they're not sequestering as much as what one initially expected. And so the bad news is that all the climate models, at least at this level, are saying, yes, they do sequester, but not as much. Uh, in, for example, what happens is that there's less rain than expected in the regions around the equator where most of the biomass would be growing. Uh, the rain, the biggest increases in rain are up in the northern latitudes where you don't get much sunlight. So, um, so we, unless we sequester the carbon, I, I think there's going to be a real problem uh, here. And uh, I've got to move along, so I'm not going to talk about carbon sequestration. Uh, one word about fusion. This is actually from a slide of Rob Goldstone, who's the head of the uh, Department of Energy lab at Princeton, which is, uh, does the tokamak research. And this is a moderate uh, estimate of the primary energy consumption 
And uh, so when ITER, this is this uh, multinational experiment, goes online to see whether things are scaling properly, that we can really confine a plasma for hundreds of seconds, uh, then immediately following that is the hope that you can get a demonstration pilot plant. Uh, and then finally after that, then commercialization. So a very aggressive line of commercialization, but this is 2010, and so this is the difference. If all goes well, there are no showstoppers, and it works perfectly. Uh, the point here is that fusion will not be a major player in the 21st century. So we've got to get something else. That's not to say we shouldn't give up hope, but, but don't count on it, certainly for the next 50 years, probably 75 or 80 years. Fission. Um, well, um, there's fission, but it has two primary problems, waste and nuclear proliferation. If you want to total power generation from fission in the United States, that would mean you would make one major um, power plant every week for the next 50 years. And so this can only be a partial solution if you're willing to go this route. Um, this is taken from uh, uh, a slide from General Atomics where there are new classes of reactors. These are so-called carbon pebble bed reactors. There's a block of graphite. You put little BBs, uh, millimeter in size, uh, of nuclear fuel in this. The idea here is that the hope is that they're going to be much safer. They're what we call passively safe. What that means is suppose something goes awry and you actually lose all control of the plant. No, no electricity. Uh, what happens is that the temperature will rise, but it will not rise to a dangerous level, and the time axis is days. And so it will rise. The hope is that these reactors are passively safe. The current set of nuclear reactors we have today have lots of backup systems that immediately dump cooling water in and backups to those backup systems and so on. Um, uh, Rob uh, talked about um, uh, this is a plot of time versus nuclear production, if you assume that electricity growth continues on its current path uh, and you assume that we're going to use 20 percent of electricity generation is going to come from nuclear power, then you're on this growth curve in terms of the amount of uh, nuclear power you'll be generating. And over here is the amount of waste you're being generating. That's that dash curve over here. And so there's a, there is a concern about the amount of waste if you're going to keep uh, uh, and, and I, since Rob, uh, I'm, not, I'm going to pass on this, maybe we can go on in the question and answer period about what to do with this waste. But at the moment, um, uh, you will be generating a lot of waste as we currently uh, use the technology today. That's put it in a fuel rod, use it once, and then store it. So wind, uh, s photovoltaics, and biomass I'll, I'll end on. Um, so this is now getting to really, truly renewable stuff. Uh, wind is a tremendous success story. Uh, from 1980 to 2000, the cost of wind generation has absolutely plummeted. And it's now around five or six cents a kilowatt hour uh, of an, after you amortize the cost of uh, putting up these uh, wind generators. These are now uh, going to one and two megawatts per wind turbine. They're getting to, there, there's a a limit of the theoretical efficiency if you took this wind and it's got a, a certain amount of kinetic energy and it all gets deposited into making the rotor turn, uh, but then you have to have some continuity because you've got to have some air in the back. And so if you put in these calculations, you find that you can extract as much as 59 percent of that kinetic energy. These things are approaching 50 percent. It's amazing. Uh, we don't know how to store wind energy very effectively. The most effective way at the moment, if you don't immediately put it on the, electric, on the grid, where it has to be used immediately, what, the most effective way is to pump it underground in, into a cave or an abandoned gas well, and then you uh, bring it back up as pressurized air. You use a little gas, spin a turbine. And so you need some, if this is going to be a major factor uh, in the um, baseline grid, we have to get better at storing the energy. Solar cells are our wild card in terms of major source of electricity, not the boutique stuff like the little emergency uh, phone on the side of the highway or in very isolated areas. But if it's going to become a major part of the electricity generation 
uh, in the United States, the feeling is it would have to come down by a factor of five at least and possibly ten. Um, and there's limitations in the amount of silicon. Uh, there are new ways, if those of you in the audience who are not physicists, just ignore what these words mean. Uh, just to say that um, uh, there are people out there thinking very hard about revolutionizing solar photovoltaic generation, uh, going away from silicon using other semiconductor materials with solar concentrators. Uh, very recently, uh, there, there was, used to be a limit of 37 percent, now it's up to 40 plus percent. Um, there are new ways, perhaps, of totally different ways of using nanotechnologies to make solar cells. Uh, but this is all very exploratory. It, it, it's a wild card. Um, biomass. Okay, so nature has figured out how to capture sunlight uh, energy, and with a mixture of sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and some nutrients, they can convert it into chemical energy. I don't know why I did that. But, um, okay, so how much biomass can we grow? So if you look at the amount of land on Earth, it's about 13 billion hectares, of which most, most of it is non-arable in the form of deserts or mountains or forests and savannas. So let's say this is off the table. Uh, there are a substantial part of 12 percent or 11 percent of the land is actually under, currently under intensive agricultural use, and the rest, a lot more, is on pasture and rangeland. Um, one of the miracles uh, that has occurred in the last half century is that we now feel pretty comfortable that we can feed not only the current world population of about six and a half billion people, but the current predictions vary, but it's now predicted we may be peaking at, on scale of 10 billion, I've heard as low as nine and a half billion, as high as 11 or 12, but the world population might peak around that order. Um, from 1915 to 1995, uh, this is the, if we did nothing in terms of the technology of growing food, this is what, how much more land we would have had to put under uh, cultivation, and in fact, we put this much land under cultivation. And in fact, in 1950, there were many more mass starvations. We have a food distribution problem, but we do not have a problem in growing enough food to feed the world population today. And we actually don't have a problem in feeding, in a, if the climate doesn't change, in feeding the world's population uh, when the population does peak. This is an estimate um, of how much more land can be, is suitable for rain-fed crops, non-irrigated crops, uh, in various sections around the world. And there's very low utilization, ironically, in the poorest areas around the world. Now, if you take this at face value and just say, okay, suppose you use all the land that's suitable for rain-fed crops, uh, you, you go from this 1.5 billion hectares to 14 billion, an order of magnitude increase. So you can derate that, but it, what I'm saying is there, there may be a billion or more hectares uh, conservatively that we can put under cultivation. Now, if you're growing this stuff, what do you want to grow? Do you want to grow corn, for example? Uh, probably not. Uh, sugar is good in Brazil especially because you can get two crops of uh, sugar a year. They have a nice climate for that. They have lots of rain. Uh, but in places like the United States, Europe, a lot of parts of Asia, maybe you don't want to grow these complex starches, but you actually want to grow even more complex starches, namely the stuff that the plant mostly makes is cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So the idea here is uh, can you uh, use a plant to capture this stuff into biomass, and then can you convert it more efficiently into chemical energy? Um, well, you can, and can, how can you improve this? So you can actually make these plants self-fertilizing and drought resistant, and you can also improve on the conversion of biomass into chemical energy, where there are tremendous energy investments in converting the biomass to chemical energy. Cellulose into, let's say, ethanol it requires a lot of energy input. Um, it's possible to make plants self-fertilizing, either to uh, actually put in nitrogen fixation genes in the plant or to major them so that they end in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in the root nodules. 
In the olden days, before we started using fertilizer, which is made from uh, methane, uh, which is made from ammonia, which comes from natural gas, uh, we used to uh, rotate crops and they would re-fertilize the soil that way. Uh, it's possible now to begin to think about making uh, sugar cane actually fixes a lot of the nitrogen. We can make them drought resistant so if it doesn't rain, they don't die, they just slow, slow their growth. And so uh, these are uh, drought resistant versions of soybeans and corn versus the non-drought resistant versions. Um, there are things other than, uh, th in this case, this is Methanticus giganticus. It even grows faster and more efficiently than switchgrass. Um, if you take optimistic numbers, you take a billion hectares, remember up to 14 billion hectares uh, you can plant in the world, and you uh, use a conversion efficiency of so much dry tonnage of growth you can get per acre and converting it to ethanol, you can get over uh, 100 billion barrels of oil, and the current uses is 28. And those are optimistic numbers, but even if you divide by 10, uh, you can get um, a pretty significant input. In the United States, and this is the number I'm using, 200 gallons of ethanol per dry ton, it's about a factor two greater than current technology. It's only a factor two greater. Um, and we ha now have either 450, we have 450 million acres either under cultivation or we pay farmers not to plant. Uh, about a quarter of that or a fifth of that we pay farmers not to plant. If you take out of that 200 million acres, you're, you can generate using these assumptions 17 billion barrels of oil, and right now our transportation uses that much. Again, you can derate this any way you want, but all I'm saying is it could be a, an important wedge. Um, uh, great inroads can be made on the commercial ethanol production. Um, this is a, a pilot plant, but it's unfortunately very energy intensive. Uh, there's a lot of energy that's put in here to heat, it, heat up the plants uh, with pressurized steam and they use hot acid to break down the lignin. There may be better ways. Um, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Jay Kiesling, uh, who's also a professor in chemical engineering here, has figured out how to uh, make uh, a chemical that's extracted from a plant grown in Southeast Asia that turns out to be a miracle malarial drug. He's taught E. coli how to grow this chemical precursor, and he's improved the yield of this E. coli by more than a million fold. And now uh, he's commercializing this so it can be sold to third world countries. The target goal is 25 cents per cure. And, uh, this type of technology can be used to perhaps grow uh, microbes or create microbes that can break down cellulose in a much more efficient manner or convert directly from sunlight uh, to chemical fuel. As was noted, I spent some time at Bell Laboratories. In fact, I used to live right over there. I'd hop the fence and walk, walk to work. It was, it was a great time. It was a great time in many other respects. Uh, it was an, the science palace of the world when when I, I felt that, at least, when I was there. Um, and the 15 scientists who've worked at Bell Laboratories have received Nobel Prizes. Now, one of the things at Bell Labs, they invented two things you might have heard of, the transistor and the laser. This is the first transistor. Uh, it's not much to look at. It, you know, it's, it's only a mother would like something that, like that. <laughs> And these are the inventors of the transistor, uh, Bill Shockley, uh, Bardeen Shockley and Bertin, um, and they received the Nobel Prize for its invention. What many people don't realize is not only was it a great physics achievement, it was actually needed, required great advances in material science as well as theoretical and experimental science and required fundamental understandings of what was going on in the electrons in these semiconductors. It was a team effort, many teams, and it could not have been, if it was done in university-based research, it would have taken at least a factor two longer. It took them nine years from the time when they found you can put two pieces of semiconductor together and it would conduct electricity one way to inventing the first solid-state amplifier. Nine years. So here we are uh, today. Uh, I'm privileged to direct Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. It too is a very distinguished laboratory in its history. We've had 10 Nobel Prize winners, eight of which did their Nobel Prize winning work at the lab. We have roughly 3% of the membership of the National Academy of Sciences in this place. 
And um, we're doing many things having to do with energy, including the division that Art Rosenfeld started, energy efficiency. We're working on uh, carbon sequestration. We're doing a lot of the calculations for fusion. Uh, we're uh, very active in enhanced oil recovery and geothermal work. But what we'd like to do, and we're starting a major initiative at the lab, I've been designing this for the last year or so, of looking at paths of converting solar energy into usable energy, either as electricity that you can put on the grid, or in the very highest value energy we need is the liquid fuels that can supply our needs in transportation. So there's a number of ways of doing this. Uh, many of our top scientists are getting very, very energized about doing work here. The members in the National Academy, uh, future members in the National Academy, have gotten very excited. And so, <laughs> and so uh, uh, one of the things is that we have a wonderful material science complex. There's a new nano building. There are two material science buildings. There's the National Center for Electron Microscopy. There is arguably the best synchrotron radiation uh, light source in the United States today, and we'd like to put now a Helios building here, which would be the centerpiece of this solar research. It's something that many of us are very excited about, and uh, this would, Art started this um, uh, great thing at the lab in terms of uh, doing something about the demand side of energy, and I think the lab can also do a great deal on the supply side as well. So with that, I'll stop. <laughs>
let's say, the corn stover for corn or the, the cane stuff for sugar, and they would leave it in the ground and they would let it rot, if you will. And it was doing some actual magic that we don't fully understand uh, in terms of the microbes in the soil. The good news is you don't only have to leave half of it or a third of it there, and you've, you still have that. Uh, but I was thinking more sort of about the replacement of, of say, a rainforest with palm oil plantations. Uh, actually, you know, this, I don't think you need to go that far. We now have, in the United States, we have 450 million acres under cultivation. Uh, we can easily shift 20%. In fact, we can't use that land to grow crop, heavily subsidized crops anymore that we can sell in the open world trade market because, because of world trade agreements. And, and, we, and we can't eat anymore in the United States, or we shouldn't eat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so we have a great uh, natural resource where 20% where to grow energy and to also utilize all the bio waste that we generate and to capture all that would go a long way and it varies between all the transportation fuel to you know half or a third, but but it, it can be very significant. And and no more. And that means you don't plant everything. You know. Okay, just what we have now. Okay, next question. Yeah, Gerald Harris from uh, Global Business Network. We're in the post-species business of scenario planning. Uh, my question, I think, is related to this one: is Is there a pathway in which, as you pursue one of these solutions or one of these wedges, it actually enables the other? So, is there any kind of positive cumulative effect through a system of these that you can actually envision? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, we going back to the agricultural stuff. You know, in the same place where you can grow lots of food, uh, not food, but crops for energy, you also have lots of wind. Uh, there's all sorts of synergies. Now you've got some electricity. Uh, maybe you can use some of that electricity to do some of the chemistry in order to convert the biomass into. There's all sorts of real potential out there. Uh, even the self-fertilizing stuff would be great because it means that our uh, agriculture becomes less energy intensive and less water polluting. Efficiency. <laughs> Let me get That's the wedge that enables the others. Yes. Yeah, ex exactly. One example of wedges enabling one another is if, 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 you tried to, if you want a hydrogen vehicle and you're trying to drive a 30-mile-a-gallon vehicle, you have a lot of storage on board and it's a real problem. If you make that 100-mile-a-gallon, then you can begin to make it within, within range. So that's an example of efficiency buying you the, the next wedge and there being a positive interaction. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I want to – they're absolutely right. Uh, as I said before, the lowest hanging fruit still remains efficiency. And think factors are two or four. At least two. At least factors of four, I would say. Okay, in the decrease per person of energy use and still maintain a very high standard of living, the current standard of living, really. Um, Harrison Fraker, I'm Dean of the College of Environmental Design. When I talk to Inez Fung and she talks about her atmospheric scientist friends, uh, they're very worried about the 550 parts per million number and suggest we should be trying to shoot well below that. In fact, we should be trying to reverse where we are now. Uh, what are some of the implications of that in terms of your projections? I would agree with her. I mean, that was, I think, the point of a, the earlier speakers, uh, uh, that the 550 is a bad number already. Uh, unfortunately, I have to confess, I think we're going to go through 550. We're going to go above 550. Uh, so, the, uh, the, so the question, I think, is whether, what can we do to capture carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Uh, and, and or Not created is, is clean carbon sequestration, uh, things of that nature, nuclear possibly, at least some fraction, uh, until we get these more, the solar-based stuff really going. Uh, I, I, just a, just, just a quick comment that when you th saw that picture with seven wedges, I mean, it's a schematic, but if you had two or three more, you can get down to the 450 range. It's hard to get that number, and it's an easy number to remember level emissions in 50 years. But if we, ha I mean, the, the other really does amount to cutting emissions something like in half in 50 years to get to those lower numbers. Are, 
Uh, I'd like to ask a, a computation. Oh, my name is Ned Birdsell. Um, make a, a, a comment about how big a computer do we need to run an entire fusion machine? The, the back of the envelope calculation is if we have a petaflop computer, we can simulate an entire fusion machine. How about your computers up on the hill? Uh, They're uh, not up to petaflop. Nobody. I didn't. I don't actually understand the question because a fusion machine is a piece of metal and you know vacuum and things That's like that. But so you're talking about how do you want to simulate? Ah, uh, and so to do the eater experiment on on, oh, okay, on a computer. Yeah. Uh, I'm an experimental physicist. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, I think with that, it's a perfect time to take a break. Let's thank our speakers for. <laughs>